Disc 6 Sir Ernest Heavyweather's speech in opening the case for the defence was not a long one, but it was backed by the full force of his emphatic manner. Never, he said, in the course of his long experience, had he known a charge of murder to rest on slighter evidence. Not only was it entirely circumstantial, but the greater part of it was practically unproved. Let them take the testimony they had heard and sift it impartially. The strychnine had been found in a drawer in the prisoner's room. That drawer was an unlocked one, as he had pointed out, and he submitted that there was no evidence to prove that it was the prisoner who had concealed the poison there. It was, in fact, a wicked and malicious attempt on the part of some third person to fix the crime on the prisoner. The prosecution had been unable to produce a shred of evidence in support of their contention that it was the prisoner who ordered the black beard from Parkson's. The quarrel which had taken place between the prisoner and his stepmother was freely admitted. But both it and his financial embarrassments had been grossly exaggerated. His learned friend, Sir Ernest nodded carelessly at Mr Phillips, had stated that if the prisoner were an innocent man, he would have come forward at the inquest to explain that it was he and not Mr Inglethorpe who had been the participator in the quarrel. He thought the facts had been misrepresented. What had actually occurred was this. The prisoner, returning to the house on Tuesday evening, had been authoritatively told that there had been a violent quarrel between Mr and Mrs Inglethorpe. No suspicion had entered the prisoner's head that anyone could possibly have mistaken his voice for that of Mr Inglethorpe. He naturally concluded that his stepmother had had two quarrels. The prosecution averred that on Monday, July the 16th, the prisoner had entered the chemist's shop in the village disguised as Mr Inglethorpe. The prisoner, on the contrary, was at that time at a lonely spot called Marston's Spinney, where he had been summoned by an anonymous note, couched in blackmailing terms and threatening to reveal certain matters to his wife unless he complied with its demands. The prisoner had, accordingly, gone to the appointed spot and, after waiting there vainly for half an hour, had returned home. Unfortunately, he had met with no one on the way there or back who could vouch for the truth of his story. But luckily, he had kept the note and it would be produced as evidence. As for the statement relating to the destruction of the will, the prisoner had formerly practised at the bar and was perfectly well aware that the will made in his favour a year before was automatically revoked by his stepmother's remarriage. He would call evidence to show who did destroy the will, and it was possible that that might open up quite a new view of the case. Finally, he would point out to the jury that there was evidence against other people besides John Cavendish. He would direct their attention to the fact that the evidence against Mr Lawrence Cavendish was quite as strong, if not stronger, than that against his brother. He would now call the prisoner. John acquitted himself well in the witness box. Under Sir Ernest's skilful handling, he told his tale credibly and well. The anonymous note received by him was produced and handed to the jury to examine. The readiness with which he admitted his financial difficulties and the disagreement with his stepmother lent value to his denials. At the close of his examination, he paused and said, I should like to make one thing clear. I utterly reject and disapprove of Sir Ernest Heavyweather's insinuations against my brother. My brother, I am convinced, had no more to do with the crime than I have. Sir Ernest merely smiled and noted with a sharp eye that John's protest had produced a very favourable impression on the jury. Then the cross-examination began. I understand you to say that it never entered your head that the witnesses at the inquest could possibly have mistaken your voice for that of Mr Inglethorpe. Is that not very surprising? Uh, no, I don't think so. I was told there'd been a quarrel between my mother and Mr Inglethorpe, and it never occurred to me that such was not really the case. Well, not when the servant Dorcas repeated certain fragments of the conversation, fragments which you must have recognised? But I did not recognise them. Your memory must be unusually short. No, but we were both angry, and I think said more than we meant. I paid very little attention to my mother's actual words. Mr Phillips's incredulous sniff was a triumph of forensic skill. He passed on to the subject of the note. 
You have produced this note very opportunely. Tell me, is there nothing familiar about the handwriting of it? Not that I know of. Do you think that it bears a marked resemblance to your own handwriting, carelessly disguised? Uh, no, I don't think so. I put it to you that it is your own handwriting. No. I put it to you that, anxious to prove an alibi, you conceived the idea of a fictitious and rather incredible appointment and wrote this note yourself in order to bear out your own statement. No. Is it not a fact that at the time you claim to have been waiting about at a solitary and unfrequented spot, you were really in the chemist's shop in Style St. Mary, where you purchased strychnine in the name of Alfred Inglethorpe? No, that's a lie. I put it to you that wearing a suit of Mr. Inglethorpe's clothes with a black beard trimmed to resemble his, you were there and signed the register in his name. That is absolutely untrue. Then I will leave the remarkable similarity of handwriting between the note, the register, and your own to the consideration of the jury, said Mr. Phillips, and sat down with the air of a man who has done his duty, but who was nevertheless horrified by such deliberate perjury. After this, as it was growing late, the case was adjourned till Monday. Poirot, I noticed, was looking profoundly discouraged. He had that little frown between the eyes that I knew so well. What is it, Poirot? I inquired. Ah, mon ami, things are going badly. Badly. In spite of myself, my heart gave a leap of relief. Evidently, there was a likelihood of John Cavendish being acquitted. When we reached the house, my little friend waved aside Mary's offer of tea. Ah, uh, non. I thank you, madame. I will mount to my room. I followed him. Still frowning, he went across to the desk and took out a small pack of patience cards. Then he drew up a chair to the table and, to my utter amazement, began solemnly to build card houses. My jaw dropped involuntarily, and he said at once, No, mon ami, I am not in my second childhood. I steady my nerves, that is all. This employment requires precision of the fingers. With the precision of the fingers goes precision of the brain. And never have I needed that more than now. What is the trouble? I asked. With a great thump on the table, Poirot demolished his carefully built-up edifice. It is this, mon ami, that I can build card houses seven stories high, but I cannot thump. Find! that last link of which I spoke to you. I could not quite tell what to say, so I held my peace, and he began slowly building up the cards again, speaking in jerks as he did so. It is done so, by placing one card on another with mathematical precision. I watched the card house rising under his hands, story by story. He never hesitated or faltered. It was really almost like a conjuring trick. What a steady hand you've got, I remarked. I believe I've only seen your hand shake once. Ah, on an occasion when I was enraged, without doubt, observed Poirot with great placidity. Yes, indeed, you were in a towering rage. Do you remember? It was when you discovered that the lock of the dispatch case in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom had been forced. You stood by the mantelpiece, twiddling the things on it in your usual fashion, and your hand shook like a leaf. I must say I... But I stopped suddenly. For Poirot, uttering a hoarse and inarticulate cry again annihilated his masterpiece of cards, and putting his hands over his eyes, swayed backwards and forwards, apparently suffering the keenest agony. "'Good heavens, Poirot!' I cried. "'What's the matter? Are you taken ill?' "'No, no,' he gasped. "'It is, it is, that I have an idea!' "'Oh!' I exclaimed, much relieved. "'One of your little ideas!' Ah, ma foi, non, replied Poirot frankly. This time it is an idea gigantic, stupendous, and you, you, my friend, have given it to me.
Suddenly, clasping me in his arms, he kissed me warmly on both cheeks, and before I had recovered from my surprise, ran headlong from the room. Mary Cavendish entered at that moment. What is the matter with Monsieur Poirot? He rushed past me, crying out, A garage! For the love of heaven, direct me to a garage, madame! And before I could answer, he had dashed out into the street. I hurried to the window. True enough, there he was, tearing down the street, hatless and gesticulating as he went. I turned to Mary with a gesture of despair. He'll be stopped by a policeman in another minute. There he goes, round the corner. Our eyes met, and we stared helplessly at one another. What can be the matter? I shook my head. I don't know. He was building card houses when suddenly he said he had an idea and rushed off, as you saw. Well, said Mary, I expect he'll be back before dinner. But night fell, and Poirot had not returned. Chapter 12 The Last Link Poirot's abrupt departure had intrigued us all greatly. Sunday morning wore away, and still he did not reappear. But about three o'clock a ferocious and prolonged hooting outside drove us to the window to see Poirot alighting from a car, accompanied by Jap and Summerhay. The little man was transformed. He radiated an absurd complacency. He bowed with exaggerated respect to Mary Cavendish. Madame, I have your permission to hold a little réunion in the salon. It is necessary for everyone to attend. Mary smiled sadly. You know, Monsieur Poirot, that you have carte blanche in every way. Ah, you are too amiable, madame. Still beaming, Poirot marshalled us all into the drawing-room, bringing forward chairs as he did so. Miss Howard, here. Mademoiselle Cynthia. Monsieur Lawrence. The good Dorcas. And Annie. Bien. We must delay our proceedings a few minutes until Mr. Inglethorpe arrives. I have sent him a note. Miss Howard rose immediately from her seat. If that man comes into the house, I leave it. No, no. Poirot went up to her and pleaded in a low voice. Finally, Miss Howard consented to return to her chair. A few minutes later, Alfred Inglethorpe entered the room. The company, once assembled, Poirot rose from his seat with the air of a popular lecturer and bowed politely to his audience. Monsieur, Madame, as you all know, I was called in by Monsieur John Cavendish to investigate this case. I at once examined the bedroom of the deceased, which by the advice of the doctors had been kept locked, and was consequently exactly as it had been when the tragedy occurred. I found, first, a fragment of green material, Secondly, a stain on the carpet near the window still damp. Thirdly, an empty box of bromide powders. To take a fragment of green material first, I found it caught in the bolt of the communicating door between that room and the adjoining one occupied by Mademoiselle Cynthia. I handed the fragment over to the police, who did not consider it of much importance. Nor did they recognize it for what it was a piece torn from a green land armlet. There was a little stir of excitement. Now, there was only one person at Styles who worked on the land, Mrs. Cavendish. Therefore, it must have been Mrs. Cavendish who entered the deceased's room through the door communicating with Mademoiselle Cynthia's room. But that door was bolted on the inside, I cried. When I examined the room, yes. But in the first place, we have only her word for it, since it was she who tried that particular door and reported it fastened. In the ensuing confusion, she would have had ample opportunity to shoot the bolt across. I took an early opportunity of verifying my conjectures. To begin with, the fragment corresponds exactly with a tear in Mrs. Cavendish's armlet. Also, at the inquest, Mrs. Cavendish declared that she had heard from her own room the fall of the table by the bed. I took an early opportunity of testing that statement by stationing my friend 
Monsieur Hastings in the left wing of the building, just outside Mrs. Cavendish's door. I, myself, in company with the police, went to the deceased's room, and whilst there, I apparently accidentally knocked over the table in question, but found that, as I had expected, Monsieur Hastings had heard no sound at all. This confirmed my belief that Mrs. Cavendish was not speaking the truth when she declared that she had been dressing in her room at the time of the tragedy. In fact, I was convinced that far from having been in her own room, Mrs. Cavendish was actually in the deceased's room when the alarm was given. I shot a quick glance at Mary. She was very pale, but smiling. I proceeded to reason on that assumption. Mrs. Cavendish is in her mother-in-law's room. We will say that she is seeking for something and has not yet found it. Suddenly, Mrs. Inglethorpe awakens and is seized with an alarming paroxysm. She flings out her arm, overturning the bed table, and then pulls desperately at the bell. Mrs. Cavendish, startled, drops her candle, scattering the grease on the carpet. She picks it up and retreats quickly to Mademoiselle Cynthia's room, closing the door behind her. She hurries out into the passage, for the servants must not find her where she is. But it is too late. Already footsteps are echoing along the gallery which connects the two wings. What can she do? Quick as thought, she hurries back to the young girl's room and starts shaking her awake. The hastily aroused household come trooping down the passage. They are all busily battering at Mrs. Inglethorpe's door. It occurs to nobody that Mrs. Cavendish has not arrived with the rest, but, and this is significant, I can find no one who saw her come from the other wing. He looked at Mary Cavendish. Am I right, madame? She bowed her head. Quite right, monsieur. You understand that if I had thought I would do my husband any good by revealing these facts, I would have done so but it did not seem to me to bear upon the question of his guilt or innocence. In a sense that is correct, madame, but it cleared my mind of many misconceptions and left me free to see other facts in their true significance. The will! cried Lawrence. Then it was you, Mary, who destroyed the will. She shook her head, and Poirot shook his also. No, he said quietly. There is only one person who could possibly have destroyed that will, Mrs. Inglethorpe herself. Impossible, I exclaimed. She had only made it out that very afternoon. Nevertheless, mon ami, it was Mrs. Inglethorpe, because in no other way can you account for the fact that on one of the hottest days of the year, Mrs. Inglethorpe ordered a fire to be lighted in her room. I gave a gasp. What idiots we had been never to think of that fire as being incongruous. Poirot was continuing. The temperature on that day, monsieur, was eighty degrees in the shade. Yet Mrs. Inglethorpe ordered a fire. Why? Because she wished to destroy something and could think of no other way. You will remember that in consequence of the war economies practiced at Styles, no waste paper was thrown away. There was therefore no means of destroying a thick document such as a will. The moment I heard of a fire being lighted in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, I leapt to the conclusion that it was to destroy some important document, possibly a will. So, the discovery of the charred fragment in the grate was no surprise to me. I did not, of course, know at the time that the will in question had only been made that afternoon, and I will admit that when I learned that fact, I fell into a grievous error. I came to the conclusion that Mrs. Inglethorpe's determination to destroy her will arose as a direct consequence of the quarrel she had that afternoon, and that therefore the quarrel took place after, and not before, the making of the will. Here, as we know, I was wrong, and I was forced to abandon that idea. I faced the problem from a new standpoint. Now, at four o'clock, Dorcas overheard her mistress saying angrily, You need not think that any fear of publicity or scandal between husband and wife will deter me. I conjectured, and conjectured rightly, that these words were addressed not to her husband, but to Mr. John Cavendish. At five o'clock, 
An hour later, she uses almost the same words, but the standpoint is different. She admits to Dorcas, I don't know what to do. Scandal between husband and wife is a dreadful thing. At four o'clock, she has been angry, but completely mistress of herself. At five o'clock, she is in violent distress and speaks of having had a great shock. Looking at the matter psychologically, I drew one deduction which I was convinced was correct. The second scandal she spoke of was not the same as the first, and it concerned herself. Let us reconstruct. At four o'clock, Mrs. Inglethorpe quarrels with her son and threatens to denounce him to his wife, who, by the way, overheard the greater part of the conversation. At 4.30, Mrs. Inglethorpe, in consequence of a conversation on the validity of wills, makes a will in favour of her husband, which the two gardeners witness. At five o'clock, Dorcas finds her mistress in a state of considerable agitation, with a slip of paper, a letter, Dorcas thinks, in her hand, and it is then that she orders the fire in her room to be lighted. Presumably, then, between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, something has occurred to occasion a complete revolution of feeling, since she is now as anxious to destroy the will as she was before to make it. What was that something? Hmm. As far as we know, she was quite alone during that half hour. Nobody entered or left that boudoir. What then occasioned the sudden change of sentiment? One can only guess, but I believe my guess to be correct. Mrs. Inglethorpe had no stamps in her desk. We know this because later she asked Dorcas to bring her some. Now, in the opposite corner of the room stood her husband's desk, locked. She was anxious to find some stamps, and, according to my theory, she tried her own keys in the desk. That one of them fitted, I know. She therefore opened the desk, and in searching for the stamps, she came across something else. That slip of paper which Dorcas saw in her hand, and which assuredly was never meant for Mrs. Inglethorpe's eyes. On the other hand, Mrs. Cavendish believed that the slip of paper to which her mother-in-law clung so tenaciously was a written proof of her own husband's infidelity. She demanded it from Mrs. Inglethorpe, who assured her quite truly that it had nothing to do with that matter. Mrs. Cavendish did not believe her. She thought that Mrs. Inglethorpe was shielding her stepson. Now, Mrs. Cavendish is a very resolute woman, and, behind her mask of reserve, she was madly jealous of her husband. She determined to get hold of that paper at all costs, and in this resolution chance came to her aid. She happened to pick up the key of Mrs. Inglethorpe's dispatch case, which had been lost that morning. She knew that her mother-in-law invariably kept all important papers in this particular case. Mrs. Cavendish therefore made her plans as only a woman driven desperate through jealousy could have done. Sometime in the evening, she unbolted the door leading into Mademoiselle Cynthia's room. Possibly she applied oil to the hinges, for I found that it opened quite noiselessly when I tried it. She put off her project until the early hours of the morning as being safer, since the servants were accustomed to hearing her move about her room at that time. She dressed completely in her land kit, and made her way quietly through Mademoiselle Cynthia's room into that of Mrs. Inglethorpe. He paused a moment, and Cynthia interrupted. "'But I should have woken up if anyone had come through my room.' "'Not if you were drugged, mademoiselle.' "'Drugged? Mais oui. "'You remember,' he addressed us collectively again, "'that through all the tumult and noise next door, "'Mademoiselle Cynthia slept. "'That admitted of two possibilities. "'Either her sleep was feigned, which I did not believe,' or her unconsciousness was induced by artificial means. With this latter idea in my mind, I examined all the coffee cups most carefully, remembering that it was Mrs. Cavendish who had brought Mademoiselle Cynthia her coffee the night before. I took a sample from each cup and had them analysed. 
with no result. I had counted the cups carefully in the event of one having been removed. Six persons had taken coffee, and six cups were duly found. I had to confess myself mistaken. Then I discovered that I had been guilty of a very grave oversight. Coffee had been brought in for seven persons, not six, for Dr. Bowerstein had been there that evening. This changed the face of the whole affair, for there was now one cup missing. The servants noticed nothing, since Annie, the housemaid who took in the coffee, brought in seven cups, not knowing that Mr. Inglethorpe never drank it, whereas Dorcas, who cleared them away the following morning, found six as usual. Or, strictly speaking, she found five the sixth being the one found broken in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room. I was confident that the missing cup was that of Mademoiselle Cynthia. I had an additional reason for that belief, in the fact that all the cups found contained sugar, which Mademoiselle Cynthia never took in her coffee. My attention was attracted by the story of Annie about some salt on the tray of cocoa which she took every night to Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, I accordingly secured a sample of that cocoa and sent it to be analysed. Uh, but that had already been done by Dr. Bowerstein, said Lawrence quickly. Not exactly. The analyst was asked by him to report whether strychnine was or was not present. He did not have it tested, as I did, for a narcotic. For a narcotic? Yes. Here is the analyst's report. Mrs. Cavendish administered a safe but effectual narcotic to both Mrs. Inglethorpe and Mademoiselle Cynthia, and it is possible that she had a mauvais quart d'heure in consequence. Imagine her feelings when her mother-in-law is suddenly taken ill and dies, and immediately after she hears the word poison. She has believed that the sleeping draught she administered was perfectly harmless, but there is no doubt that for one terrible moment she must have feared that Mrs. Inglethorpe's death lay at her door. She is seized with panic, and under its influence she hurries downstairs and quickly drops the coffee cup and saucer used by Mademoiselle Cynthia into a large brass vase, where it is discovered later by Monsieur Lawrence. The remains of the cocoa she dare not touch. Too many eyes are upon her. Guess at her relief when strychnine is mentioned, and she discovers that after all the tragedy is not her doing. We are now able to account for the symptoms of strychnine poisoning being so long in making their appearance. A narcotic taken with strychnine will delay the action of the poison for some hours. Poirot Mary looked up at him, the colour slowly rising in her face. "'All you have said is quite true, Monsieur Poirot. "'It was the most awful hour of my life. "'I shall never forget it. "'But you are wonderful. "'I understand now what I meant when I told you "'that you could safely confess to Papa Poirot, eh? "'But you would not trust me.' "'I see everything now,' said Lawrence. The drugged cocoa, taken on top of the poisoned coffee, amply accounts for the delay. Exactly. But was the coffee poisoned or was it not? We come to a little difficulty here, since Mrs. Inglethorpe never drank it. What? The cry of surprise was universal. No, you will remember my speaking of a stain on the carpet in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room? There were some peculiar points about a stain. It was still damp. It exhaled a strong odour of coffee, and embedded in the nap of the carpet I found some little splinters of china. What had happened was plain to me, for not two minutes before I had placed my little case on the table near the window, and the table, tilting up, had deposited it upon the floor on precisely the identical spot. In exactly the same way, Mrs. Inglethorpe had laid down her cup of coffee on reaching her room the night before, and the treacherous table had played her the same trick. What happened next is mere guesswork on my part, but I should say that Mrs. Inglethorpe picked up the broken cup and placed it on the table by the bed. Feeling in need of a stimulant of some kind, she heated up her cocoa and drank it off then and there. Now we are faced with a new problem.' 
we know the cocoa contained no strychnine. The coffee was never drunk. Yet the strychnine must have been administered between seven and nine o'clock that evening. What third medium was there, a medium so suitable for disguising the taste of strychnine that it is extraordinary that no one has thought of it? Poirot looked round the room and then answered himself impressively. Her medicine! Do you mean that the murderer introduced the strychnine into her tonic? I cried. There was no need to introduce it. It was already there in the mixture. The strychnine that killed Mrs. Inglethorpe was the identical strychnine prescribed by Dr. Wilkins. To make that clear to you, I will read you an extract from a book on dispensing which I found in the dispensary of the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster. The following prescription has become famous in textbooks. Strychninae self, GR1. Potas bromide, 3 6. Aqua ad, 3 8. Fiat mistura. This solution deposits in a few hours the greater part of the strychnine salt as an insoluble bromide in transparent crystals. A lady in England lost her life by taking a similar mixture. The precipitated strychnine collected at the bottom, and in taking the last dose, she swallowed nearly all of it. Now, there was, of course, no bromide in Dr. Wilkins' prescription, but you will remember that I mentioned an empty box of bromide powders. One or two of those powders introduced into the full bottle of medicine would effectually precipitate the strychnine, as the book describes, and cause it to be taken in that last dose. You will learn later that the person who usually poured out Mrs. Inglethorpe's medicine was always extremely careful not to shake the bottle but to leave the sediment at the bottom of it undisturbed. Throughout the case, there have been evidences that the tragedy was intended to take place on Monday evening. On that day, Mrs. Ingerthorpe's bell wire was neatly cut, and on Monday evening, Mademoiselle Cynthia was spending the night with friends, so that Mrs. Ingerthorpe would have been quite alone in the right wing, completely shut off from help of any kind, and would have died in all probability before medical aid could have been summoned. But in her hurry to be in time for the village entertainment, Mrs. Ingerthorpe forgot to take her medicine, and the next day she lunched away from home, so that the last and fatal dose was actually taken 24 hours later than had been anticipated by the murderer, and it is owing to that delay that the final proof, the last link of the chain, is now in my hands. Amid breathless excitement, he held out three thin strips of paper. A letter in the murderer's own handwriting, mes amis. Had it been a little clearer in its terms, it is possible that Mrs. Inglethorpe, warned in time, would have escaped. As it was, she realized her danger, but not the manner of it. In the deathly silence, Poirot pieced together the slips of paper, and clearing his throat, read, Dearest Evelyn, You will be anxious at hearing nothing. It is all right. Only it will be tonight instead of last night. You understand. There's a good time coming once the old woman is dead and out of the way. No one can possibly bring home the crime to me. That idea of yours about the bromides was a stroke of genius. But we must be very circumspect. A false step? Huh. Here, my friends, the letter breaks off. Doubtless the writer was interrupted, but there can be no question as to his identity. We all know this handwriting, and... A howl that was almost a scream broke the silence. You devil! How did you get it? A chair was overturned. Poirot skipped nimbly aside, a quick movement on his part, and his assailant fell with a crash. Monsieur, Madame said Poirot with a flourish. Let me introduce you to the murderer, Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe. 
Chapter 13 Poirot Explains Poirot, you old villain, I said. I've half a mind to strangle you. What do you mean by deceiving me as you have done? We were sitting in the library. Several hectic days lay behind us. In the room below, John and Mary were together once more, while Alfred Inglethorpe and Miss Howard were in custody. Now, at last, I had Poirot to myself, and could relieve my still burning curiosity. Poirot did not answer me for a moment, but at last he said, I did not deceive you, mon ami. At most, I permitted you to deceive yourself. Yes, but why? Well, it is difficult to explain. You see, my friend, you have a nature so honest and a countenance so transparent that, enfin, to conceal your feelings is impossible. If I had told you my ideas the very first time you saw Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe, that astute gentleman would have, in your so expressive idiom, smelt a rat. And then, bonjour to our chances of catching him. Well, I think I have more diplomacy than you give me credit for. My friend, besought Poirot, I implore you, do not enrage yourself. Your help has been of the most invaluable. It is by the extremely beautiful nature that you have which made me pose. Well, I grumbled a little mollified. I still think you might have given me a hint. But I did, my friend. Several hints. You would not take them. Think now, did I ever say to you that I believe John Cavendish guilty? Did I not on the contrary tell you that he would almost certainly be acquitted? Yes, but and did I not immediately afterwards speak of the difficulty of bringing the murderer to justice? Was it not plain to you that I was speaking of two entirely different persons? Well, no, I said. It was not plain to me. Then again, continued Poirot, at the beginning, did I not repeat to you several times that I didn't want Mr. Inglethorpe arrested now? That should have conveyed something to you. What do you mean to say you suspected him as long ago as that? Yes. To begin with, whoever else might benefit by Mrs. Inglethorpe's death, her husband would benefit the most. There was no getting away from that. When I went up to Styles with you on that first day, I had no idea as to how the crime had been committed. But from what I knew of Mr. Inglethorpe, I fancied that it would be very hard to find anything to connect him with it. When I arrived at the chateau, I realized at once that it was Mrs. Inglethorpe who had burnt a will, and there, by the way, you cannot complain. My friend, for I tried my best to force on you the significance of that bedroom fire in midsummer. Yes, yes, I said impatiently. Go on. Well, my friend, as I say, my views as to Mr. Inglethorpe's guilt were very much shaken. There was, in fact, so much evidence against him that I was inclined to believe that he had not done it. But when did you change your mind? When I found that the more efforts I made to clear him, the more efforts he made to get himself arrested. Then... When I discovered that Inglethorpe had nothing to do with Mrs. Rakes, and that, in fact, it was John Cavendish who was interested in that quarter, I was quite sure. But why? Simply this. If it had been Inglethorpe who was carrying on an intrigue with Mrs. Rakes, his silence was perfectly comprehensible. But when I discovered that it was known all over the village that it was John who was attracted by the farmer's pretty wife, his silence bore quite a different interpretation. It was nonsense to pretend that he was afraid of the scandal, as no possible scandal could attach to him. This attitude of his gave me furiously to think, and I was slowly forced to the conclusion that Alfred Inglethorpe wanted to be arrested. Eh bien, from that moment I was equally determined that he should not be arrested. Now, uh, uh, wait a moment. I don't see why he wished to be arrested. Because, mon ami... It is the law of your country that a man once acquitted can never be tried again for the same offence. Ha ha, but it was clever, his idea. Assuredly, he is a man of method. See here, he knew that in his position he was bound to be suspected, so he conceived the exceedingly clever idea of preparing a lot of manufactured evidence against himself. He wished to be suspected. He wished to be arrested. He would then produce his irreproachable alibi, and, hey, presto, he was safe. 
for life. But I still don't see how he managed to prove his alibi and yet go to the chemist's shop. Poirot stared at me in surprise. Is it possible? My poor friend, you have not yet realised that it was Miss Howard who went to the chemist's shop? Miss Howard? But certainly. Who else? It was most easy for her. She is of a good height, her voice is deep and manly. Moreover, remember, she and Ingerthorpe are cousins, and there is a distinct resemblance between them, especially in their gait and bearing. It was simplicity itself. <laughs> they are a clever pair. I am still a little fogged as to how exactly the bromide business was done, I remarked. Bon, I will reconstruct for you as far as possible. I am inclined to think that Miss Howard was the mastermind in that affair. You remember her once mentioning that her father was a doctor? Possibly she dispensed his medicines for him, or she may have taken the idea from one of the many books lying about when Mademoiselle Cynthia was studying for her exam. Anyway, she was familiar with the fact that the addition of a bromide to a mixture containing strychnine would cause the precipitation of the latter. Probably the idea came to her quite suddenly. Mrs. Inglethorpe had a box of bromide powders which she occasionally took at night. What could be easier, quietly, than to dissolve one or more of those powders in Mrs. Ingerthorpe's large-sized bottle of medicine, when it came from Coots? The risk is practically nil. The tragedy will not take place until nearly a fortnight later. If anyone has seen either of them touching the medicine, they will have forgotten it by that time. Miss Howard will have engineered her quarrel and departed from the house. The lapse of time and her absence will defeat all suspicion. Oh, yes, it was a clever idea. If they had left it alone, it is possible the crime might never have been brought home to them. But they were not satisfied. They tried to be too clever, and that was their undoing. Poirot puffed at his tiny cigarette, his eyes fixed on the ceiling. They arranged a plan to throw suspicion on John Cavendish, by buying strychnine at the village chemist's and signing the register in his handwriting. On Monday, Mrs. Inglethorpe will take the last dose of her medicine. On Monday, therefore, at six o'clock, Alfred Inglethorpe arranges to be seen by a number of people at a spot far removed from the village. Miss Howard has previously made up a cock and bull story about him and Mrs. Rakes to account for his holding his tongue afterwards. At six o'clock, Miss Howard, disguised as Alfred Inglethorpe, enters the chemist's shop with her story about a dog, obtains the strychnine, and writes the name of Alfred Inglethorpe in John's handwriting, which she had previously studied carefully. But, as it will never do if John, too, can prove an alibi, she writes him an anonymous note, still copying his handwriting, which takes him to a remote spot where it is exceedingly unlikely that anyone will see him. So far... All goes well. Miss Howard goes back to Middlingham. Alfred Inglethorpe returns to Styles. There is nothing that can compromise him in any way, since it is Miss Howard who has the strychnine, which, after all, is only wanted as a blind to throw suspicion on John Cavendish. But now a hitch occurs. Mrs. Inglethorpe does not take her medicine that night. The broken bell, Cynthia's absence, arranged by Inglethorpe through his wife, all these are wasted. And then he makes his slip. Mrs. Inglethorpe is out, and he sits down to write to his accomplice, who he fears may be in a panic at the non-success of their plan. It is probable that Mrs. Inglethorpe returned earlier than he expected. Caught in the act and somewhat flurried, he hastily shuts and locks his desk. He fears that if he remains in the room, he may have to open it again, and that Mrs. Inglethorpe might catch sight of the letter before he could snatch it up. So he goes out and walks in the woods, little dreaming that Mrs. Inglethorpe will open his desk and discover the incriminating document. But this, as we know, is what happened. Mrs. Inglethorpe reads it and becomes aware of the perfidy of her husband and Evelyn Howard, though unfortunately the sentence about the bromides conveys no warning to her mind. She knows that she is in danger, but is ignorant of where the danger lies. 
she decides to say nothing to her husband, but sits down and writes to her solicitor, asking him to come on the morrow. And she also determines to destroy immediately the will which she has just made. She keeps the fatal letter. It was to discover that letter, then, that her husband forced the lock of the dispatch case? Yes, and from the enormous risk he ran, we can see how fully he realized its importance. That letter accepted. There was absolutely nothing to connect him with a crime. There's only one thing I can't make out. Why didn't he destroy it at once when he got hold of it? Ah, because he did not dare take the biggest risk of all, that of keeping it on his own person. I, I don't understand. Look at it from his point of view. I have discovered that there were only five short minutes in which he could have taken it, the five minutes immediately before our own arrival on the scene. For before that time, Annie was brushing the stairs and would have seen anyone who passed going to the right wing. Figure to yourself the scene. He enters the room, unlocking the door by means of one of the other door keys. They were all much alike. He hurries to the dispatch case. It is locked and the keys are nowhere to be seen. That is a terrible blow to him, for it means that his presence in the room cannot be concealed as he had hoped. But he sees clearly that everything must be risked for the sake of that damning piece of evidence. Quickly, he forces the lock with a penknife and turns over the papers until he finds what he is looking for. But now a fresh dilemma arises. He dare not keep that piece of paper on him. He may be seen leaving the room. He may be searched. If the paper is found on him, it is certain doom. Probably at this minute, too, he hears the sounds below of Mr. Wells and John leaving the boudoir. He must act quickly. Where can he hide this terrible slip of paper? The contents of the waste paper basket are kept, and in any case are sure to be examined. There are no means of destroying it, and he dare not keep it. He looks round. And he sees. What do you think, mon ami? I shook my head. In a moment, he has torn the letter into long, thin strips, and rolling them up into spills, he thrusts them hurriedly in amongst the other spills in the vase on the mantelpiece. I uttered an exclamation. No one would think of looking there, Poirot continued, and he will be able at his leisure to come back and destroy this solitary piece of evidence against him. Then, all the time, it was in the spill vase in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom, under our very noses, I cried. Poirot nodded. Yes, my friend, that is where I discovered my last link, and I owe that very fortunate discovery to you. To me? Yes. Do you remember telling me that my hand shook as I was straightening the ornaments on the mantelpiece? Yes, but I don't see. No. But I saw. Do you know, my friend, I remember that earlier in the morning, when we had been there together, I had straightened all the objects on the mantelpiece. And if they were already straightened, there would be no need to straighten them again, unless in the meantime someone else had touched them. Dear me. I murmured. So that is the explanation of your extraordinary behaviour. You rushed down to Stiles and found it still there? Yes, and it was a race for time. But I still can't understand why Inglethorpe was such a fool as to leave it there when he had plenty of opportunity to destroy it. Ah, but he had no opportunity. I saw to that. You? Yes. Do you remember reproving me for taking the household into my confidence on the subject? Yes. Well, my friend, I saw there was just one chance. I was not sure then if Inglethorpe was the criminal or not, but if he was, I reasoned that he would not have the paper on him, but would have hidden it somewhere, and by enlisting the sympathy of the household I could effectually prevent his destroying it. He was already under suspicion, and by making the matter public I secured the services of about ten amateur detectives who would be watching him unceasingly, and being himself aware of their watchfulness, he would not dare seek further to destroy the document. He was, therefore, forced to depart from the house, leaving it in the spill vase. But surely Miss Howard had ample opportunities of aiding him. Yes, 
but Miss Howard did not know of the paper's existence. In accordance with their prearranged plan, she never spoke to Alfred Inglethorpe. Well, they were supposed to be deadly enemies, and until John Cavendish was safely convicted, they neither of them dared risk a meeting. Of course, I had a watch kept on Mr. Inglethorpe, hoping that sooner or later he would lead me to the hiding place. But he was too clever to take any chances. The paper was safe where it was. Since no one had thought of looking there in the first week, it was not likely they would do so afterwards. But for your lucky remark, we might never have been able to bring him to justice. Oh, I understand that now. But when did you first begin to suspect Miss Howard? When I discovered that she had told a lie at the inquest about a letter she had received from Mrs. Inglethorpe. Why? What was there to lie about? You saw that letter? Do you recall its general appearance? Uh, yes, more, more or less. You will recollect, then, that Mrs. Inglethorpe wrote a very distinctive hand and left large, clear spaces between her words. But if you look at the date at the top of the letter, you will notice that July 17th is quite different in this respect. Do you see what I mean? Uh, no, I confessed. I don't. You do not see that that letter was not written on the 17th, but on the 7th? the day after Miss Howard's departure? The one was written in before the seven to turn it into the seventeenth. But why? Uh, that is exactly what I ask myself. Why does Miss Howard suppress the letter written on the seventeenth and produce this faked one instead? Because she did not wish to show the letter of the seventeenth. Why again? And at once a suspicion dawned in my mind. You will remember my saying that it was wise to beware of people who were not telling you the truth. And yet, I cried indignantly, after that you gave me two reasons why Miss Howard could not have committed the crime. And very good reasons too, replied Poirot. For a long time they were a stumbling block to me until I remembered a very significant fact, that she and Alfred Inglethorpe were cousins. She could not have committed a crime single-handed, but the reasons against that did not debar her from being an accomplice. And then there was that rather over-vehement hatred of hers. Eh? He concealed the very opposite emotion. There was undoubtedly a tie of passion between them long before he came to Styles. They had already arranged their infamous plot that he should marry this rich but rather foolish old lady, induce her to make a will leaving her money to him, and then gain their ends by a very cleverly conceived crime. If all had gone as they planned, they would probably have left England and lived together on their poor victim's money. They are a very astute and unscrupulous pair. While suspicion was to be directed against him, she would be making quiet preparations for a very different denouement. She arrives from Middlingham, with all the compromising items in her possession. No suspicion attaches to her, no notice is paid to her coming and going in the house. She hides the strychnine and glasses in John's room, she puts the beard in the attic. She will see to it that sooner or later they are duly discovered. Well, I don't quite see why they tried to fix the blame on John, I remarked. It would have been easier for them to bring the crime home to Lawrence. Yes, but that was mere chance. All the evidence against him arose out of pure accident. It must, in fact, have been distinctly annoying to the pair of schemers. His manner was unfortunate, I observed thoughtfully. Yes, you realise, of course, what was at the back of that. No. You did not understand that he believed Mademoiselle Cynthia guilty of the crime? No, I exclaimed, astonished. Impossible. Not at all. I myself nearly had the same idea. It was in my mind when I asked Mr. Wells that first question about a will. Then there were the bromide powders, which she had made up, and her clever male impersonations as Dorcas recounted them to us. There was really more evidence against her than anyone else. You are joking, Poirot. No. Shall I tell you what made Monsieur Lawrence turn so pale when he first entered his mother's room on the fatal night? It was because, whilst his mother lay there, 
obviously poisoned, he saw over your shoulder that the door into Mademoiselle Cynthia's room was unbolted. But he declared that he saw it bolted, I cried. Exactly, said Poirot dryly, and that was just what confirmed my suspicion that it was not. He was shielding Mademoiselle Cynthia. But why should he shield her? Because he is in love with her. I laughed. Oh, there, Poirot, you are quite wrong. I happen to know for a fact that far from being in love with her, he positively dislikes her. Who told you that, mon ami? Cynthia herself. Ah, la pauvre petite. And she was concerned? Well, she said that she did not mind at all. Then she certainly did mind very much, remarked Poirot. They are like that, les femmes. What you say about Lawrence is a great surprise to me, I said. But why? It was most obvious. Did not Monsieur Lawrence make the sour face every time Mademoiselle Cynthia spoke and laughed with his brother? He had taken it into his long head that Mademoiselle Cynthia was in love with Monsieur John. When he entered his mother's room and saw her obviously poisoned, he jumped to the conclusion that Mademoiselle Cynthia knew something about the matter. He was nearly driven desperate. First he crushed the coffee cup to powder under his feet, remembering that she had gone up with his mother the night before, and he determined that there should be no chance of testing its contents. Thenceforward he strenuously and quite uselessly upheld the theory of death from natural causes. And what about the extra coffee cup? I was fairly certain that it was Mrs. Cavendish who had hidden it, but I had to make sure. Monsieur Lawrence did not know at all what I meant, but on reflection he came to the conclusion that if he could find an extra coffee cup anywhere, his lady love would be cleared of suspicion. And he was perfectly right. One thing more. What did Mrs. Inglethorpe mean by her dying words? They were, of course, an accusation against her husband. Oh, dear me, Poirot, I said with a sigh. I think you've explained everything. I'm glad it's all ended so happily. Even John and his wife are reconciled. Thanks to me? Well, how do you mean, thanks to you? Ah, my dear friend, do you not realise that it was simply and solely the trial which has brought them together again? That John Cavendish still loved his wife, I was convinced. Also that she was equally in love with him, but they had drifted very far apart. It all arose from a misunderstanding. She married him without love. He knew it. He is a sensitive man in his way. He would not force himself upon her if she did not want him. And as he withdrew, her love awoke. But they are both unusually proud, and their pride held them inexorably apart. He drifted into an entanglement with Mrs. Rakes, and she deliberately cultivated the friendship of Dr. Bowerstein. Do you remember the day of John Cavendish's arrest, when you found me deliberating over a big decision? Yes, I quite understood your distress. Pardon me, mon ami, but you did not understand it in the least. I was trying to decide whether or not I would clear John Cavendish at once. I could have cleared him, though it might have meant a failure to convict the real criminals. They were entirely in the dark as to my real attitude up to the very last moment, which partly accounts for my success. Do you mean that you could have saved John Cavendish from being brought to trial? Yes, my friend. But I eventually decided in favour of a woman's happiness. Nothing but the great danger through which they have passed could have brought these two proud souls together again. I looked at Poirot in silent amazement. The colossal cheek of the little man. Who on earth but Poirot would have thought of a trial for murder as a restorer of conjugal happiness? I perceive your thoughts, mon ami, said Poirot, smiling at me. No one but Hercule Poirot would have attempted such a thing. And you are wrong in condemning it. The happiness of one man and one woman is the greatest thing in all the world. His words took me back to earlier events. I remembered Mary as she lay white and exhausted on the sofa, listening, listening. 
there had come the sound of the bell below. She had started up. Poirot had opened the door, and meeting her agonised eyes, had nodded gently. Yes, madame, he said. I have brought him back to you. He had stood aside, and as I went out I had seen the look in Mary's eyes as John Cavendish had caught his wife in his arms. Perhaps you are right, Poirot, I said gently. Yes, it is the greatest thing in the world. Suddenly there was a tap at the door, and Cynthia peeped in. I, I, I only... Come in, I said, springing up. She came in, but did not sit down. I only wanted to tell you something. Yes. Cynthia fidgeted with a little tassel for some moments, then suddenly exclaiming, You dears! Kissed first me, and then Poirot, and rushed out of the room again. "'What on earth does this mean?' I asked, surprised. "'It was very nice to be kissed by Cynthia, "'but the publicity of the salute rather impaired the pleasure. "'It means that she has discovered "'Monsieur Lawrence does not dislike her as much as she thought,' "'replied Poirot philosophically. "'But here he is. "'Lawrence at that moment passed the door. "'Eh, Monsieur Lawrence,' called Poirot, "'we must congratulate you, is it not so?' Lawrence blushed and then smiled awkwardly. A man in love is a sorry spectacle. Now Cynthia had looked charming. I sighed. What is it, mon ami? Nothing, I said sadly. They are two delightful women. <laughs> and neither of them is for you, finished Poirot. Never mind. Console yourself, my friend. We may hunt together again, who knows? And then... Production Copyright 2003. All rights reserved. As part of our Mystery Masters imprint, the Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of many other Hercule Poirot mysteries, including Sad Cypress, Murder on the Orient Express, Evil Under the Sun, and Dead Man's Mirror. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audiobooks on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free 1-800-231-4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com.